is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Heartstopper, Season 1, Episode 6, Girls. In this episode, we have got some exploration of sexuality here, and it's turning out that Nick is bi, not gay, and I'm delighted. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Cindy for commissioning this episode. You guys, I had sort of like, I think in a, in a previous episode been like, maybe he's bi, but there, there was no like indicator to me that he felt anything like attraction to any of the girls in his life, even like the kiss with Tara, there's, there was no real emotion when he talked about it. So, uh, I really just sort of wrote off that idea that he was at all interested in girls. And, uh, Cindy says, well, sure. He's only 64% gay. And yeah, I'm almost like, is that exactly correct? Because I could see being bi, but just tending more towards a particular gender than another most of the time. And like, you know, there'll be exceptions in there where you're like, oh no, I'm, you are hot enough that it, like you make the list, but it not necessarily being evenly split, uh, what your attractions are. And I'm very excited that we're getting like this kind of representation here. You know, it's a really being by is like only recently being taken as seriously as it should be. It's a totally valid sexual orientation. And a lot of people have treated it like it's a cheat. Like it's, you are actually gay, but you like, don't want people to, to, you want to be like special or do or be able to be in a hetero relationship, but still have an out. Like a lot of people seem to think that folks choose their sexual identities on purpose for trends and clout. And it's a, a really funny thing to me that anybody, it, it's like what it comes down to always for me is people are assuming folks want attention on their orientations when most of the people I have met just want to be able to like what they like and go on with their lives and their entire identity wouldn't revolve around their orientation if it weren't for the fact that they constantly need to advocate for themselves and thus it seems to become their identity because they, they have to speak up or be completely erased. So and there's just a lot in media where being bi is treated like as a joke. And even in like sex in the city, it, truly, if you go back and rewatch sex in the city, it is one of the least sex positive shows ever made. Like considering the whole show was meant to be about people's sex lives these women are so narrow minded and I think it was Carrie who says like, in my opinion, bisexuality is just a stop on the way to gay town. And it was just part of a whole episode about exploring sexual identity and how Carrie just like was squicked out by it and very immature about it and just didn't. Um, and it's just a really unfortunate thing that like, even within the queer community, there are stigmas around certain identities and, you know, it's like, can't, can't we all just agree? Like we're on the same side, but no, there's always like fucking hierarchies within 
everything. And it must be so tiring, you know, to know that like, if you're queer and trans, for example, and you're in a, a like a, a queer community, there are probably going to be people who have a problem with you just because you're trans, because that's like a fucking thing. I mean, it just, ugh, I just can't imagine it. just the aching for peace. I, I really wish that I could like share that, you know, because I really get to experience it. Nobody questions a thing about me. And I wish that I could give that all to you so that you could just live. Um, <laughs> Cindy says, I'm so very glad that I never watched Sex in the City. It's so funny because like I am I enjoyed it and I remember it fondly in like a general sense, but I would never suggest anybody watch it now. It's got its moments, but it feels like the sort of thing, and this is true of like almost any comedy that seemed really edgy at the time it was made a lot of those edgy comedies don't age well because they're veering into territory that is newer. That's the point of being edgy is like you're doing something that isn't often talked about. And usually when you're doing that and it hasn't been talked about, it's folks who don't have a lot of education in the topic or a, there hasn't been a lot of study or expression of that topic. So you are edgy for the time and that feels revolutionary in the moment, but it backlashes so badly when it turns out that you are bottom tier on the subject years and years later, you just sort of have to sacrifice the longevity of your legacy for the sake of like the immediate trailblazing because at the time when it came out young women who were all talking about their sexuality openly and living alone in the city and having successful careers it was all a big deal and now it's just sort of sad because of the way that a lot of these women saw the world so it's it's really a shit <laughs> cloak says I think Sex and the City is one of those shows that could be good again if it was revamped. I've got news for you, Cloak. It was revamped. And uh, I have not heard good things. It's the sort of thing that probably could be good if it was revamped by people who actually like appreciate some of these topics and how they've changed. But from what I have heard, they did a sort of ham-fisted attempt at updating that came off as pretty, uh, pretty not great. Basically shortcuts like giving every woman a black friend so that now we can say we have people of color on the show like each of them got their own accessory just things like that so anyway this is not a sex in the city episode but i just wanted to acknowledge that bisexuality is erased a lot of the time and i it, it, it's so funny to me how we are even when being gay is like seen as such a bad thing by so many people, how is being bi also a problem? Like it's the sort of thing where we, we just want extremes, I think, because we want to be able to say a person is a thing. And if a person falls into two categories, it's confusing and makes us uncomfortable. And we don't really know what to do with that because Oh, well, she looks straight because she's in a relationship with a guy. So it doesn't count that she's bi, which is part of the reason a lot of people get up in arms around pride parades when folks are talking about how like straight couples don't deserve to be here. And people will be like, you don't know those people are straight. They could be in a hetero relationship, but each be bi. One of them could be trans. You don't know anything about them. And it's just one more step in, hopefully, our progress toward no longer trying to define everything by what it looks like, because we are, we are just addicted to that. And I get it, you know, it's nice and easy, but it's harmful and lazy, and we just need to fucking grow up. Um, 
So anyway, uh, Cloak says, I think a lot of people get hung up on by people not choosing a specific gender to be attracted to. Yeah, I really, uh, I think also there's just this weird attitude that if you're bi, it also means like you're promiscuous. Like it, because there's twice as many people that you could be attracted to, that means that you must also just be sleeping with twice as many people, which is really weird. Like, no, they may have more options, but like what you, you're th that there's just no logic behind that thought. And I think that's part of why, like, l let's be real. When we talk about sex, so much of the way we approach how we view people of different sexualities revolves around dick. Penises have just taken up so much metaphorical room in the conversation. And so it's always assumed, like, if you are a bi man, people who assume usually assume, oh, you're really gay, but you don't want to be gay because that's like too much. So you're going to say you're bi to sort of soften the fact that you are actually gay, but really you just want dick and you're just like kind of hiding behind this other label. That's for dudes. And then for women, it's you're not really bi. You just like making out with girls for attention from men. Once again, it's all about the dick. It's never I enjoy women and I genuinely want to be kissing her. It's like for male gaze. That's like what the number of people who would always dismiss women who are bi as saying they were only doing this to get guys interested. And like, do I think that that's uh, something that never happens? No, I'm sure there are girls out there who, you know, made out with other girls to be shocking or for attention, but literally like who cares? And it's just always interesting to me how much we bring things back to actually you want dudes though. It's really all about them. Can we just, I swear to God, like, it's just so tiring and boring as well. The lack of imagination that people are accusing other folks of having is really betraying their own lack of imagination. And for that, I can only pity them. Um, so I really front loaded this episode with like discussion, but truly that's what this is about. This episode is very conversation heavy and concepts like, what is it like to be out? What is it like to navigate who you're attracted to and try and figure that out? That's like the whole theme of this episode. Um, and I just really love seeing this all handled in such an open way. It's the sort of show that I'm like, I, I would love for like kids to see this and, and get a look at what it could be like if you had friends who accepted you, if you had, if you were willing to like explore resources and ask questions, I just, it makes me so sad to know how much people are, are campaigning to remove material like this from libraries and from schools. It, it is so affirming and helpful and it just makes me crazy. Like the damage that these people are doing and they claim that it's protecting their children and literally any data on the subject will tell them otherwise, but they're not actually interested in that. It's never been about protection. Protection 
is always the smoke screen. You know, it's like people talking about how they are uh, turfs because turfs could a- attack women while in disguise. Like, that's literally fucking never happened. Like, if it's ever happened, it's been a complete extreme outlier. And the idea that men would even have to be in disguise. Men assault women in the open every fucking day and get away with it. They don't need to hide. We have just made it acceptable that they do what they do and face no consequences. What dude, like men are out here getting made fun of for just wearing like a pink shirt. You think they're going to put on a dress to rape a woman? Like, does that sound like, are you fucking kidding? It's just so absolutely ludicrous. There's just nothing about it that makes any fucking sense. But we're going to say it's to protect women because the only time anybody cares about protecting women is when it's at the expense of a minority group. It used to be the target was black men specifically. And we're moving this on now to trans women. And it is the same narrative, the exact same shit. And it's so fucking transparent and tired. Anyway, um, I just, I, I, you guys, I know we're heading generally overall in the right direction. The people who are digging their heels in and saying that we need to like remove these books and these materials by and large are older people. I'm not trying to say there aren't like right wing scumbags who are younger because there definitely are. But the, the like younger generation that I have encountered have been really open minded and positive. And like recently there was a, a school where a trans girl was given homecoming queen um, or prom queen. She was voted prom queen. And she's openly trans. And I mean, can you fucking imagine like that is serious progress. I can't imagine there being an openly trans girl at my school. We were pretty much okay with gay students. We were like, we were pretty good with that. But being trans, I feel like we were not evolved enough for that. And now we're in a place where a trans girl is being voted prom queen. Like that's amazing and wonderful. And I, I really try and hold on to things like that to like, give me hope because seeing how backward we're going in so many other respects, it's so alarming and, and so predictable that it can really wear you down. And again, I'm not even a member of these communities and it wears me down. So I can't imagine when you are like your spirit must just be exhausted. So anyway, I, the, this episode is centered a a lot around the, well, what, what should I say? Who can I tell? How much should I share? What is the reaction going to be and how much does that matter? How do you handle when maybe things didn't go the way you wanted? And I really appreciate them including Tara's story because what's going on with her is, you know, it's pretty realistic and we want to think that we would handle things like Darcy who just feels like unflappable, but not all of us are built that way, man. So let's start from the beginning. We open up with, uh, Nick looking through movies on his phone and he has been searching like LGBT movies specifically. And his mom eventually says like, uh, pirates of the Caribbean. And again, she is what she's like mentioning how he was into Kira Knightley and this is what sort of gets him like huh wait hold on because he's watching you know the sexy interaction between her and Orlando Bloom and 
it's a a real sense of like wait but both of both both of them are both of them are really hot though wait wait and i i kind of loved this reaction there's a moment in sex education like this where a character is like jerking off in front of a poster that has like a man and woman and he keeps like glancing from one to the other and he doesn't know which one to keep jerking off to <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this is a much more PG version of that, but nevertheless. Um, and he goes on and uh, researches bisexuality and, like, what it means. And there's a vlogger that he is watching on YouTube and they are describing their experience of realizing who they are. I don't know if this person is, like you know, an actual figure on YouTube or an actor that they hired, or, you know, if this is like a cameo from somebody in particular whose content that they were kind of showcasing. Um, so just putting it out there, if this is somebody that I'm curious about it, but, uh, I really appreciated the inclusion of this sort of material because like, if schools are going to remove a bunch of stuff for people to explore and find out more about themselves. At least we still have the internet. And like, there are certainly ways that parents can monitor that, that schools can like, you know, but there comes a point when there's only so much you can do to stop your kid from finding shit out. So in some ways, YouTube is a cesspool and a nightmare. And in some ways it's a gift and like anything, it can go good or bad. Um, so we then go to the lunchroom at the girls' school. And we see that Darcy and Tara are coming out. Tara posted a photo of the two of them kissing on her Instagram and captioned it, girlfriends. And we see a bunch of supportive comments and a couple of really irritating comments. Congrats, Tara. Heart, heart, heart. So happy for you both. Yes. And then you don't look like a lesbian, which I love that we get the actual like graphic of her swiping left and deleting it. And I really want to point out that this was one microaggressive comment in amongst like six really positive supportive comments but it still gets to her which i mean that's so fucking relatable you guys like i cannot i wish so much that the amount of good feedback i got outweighed the bad but for the love of god if if some negative shit doesn't sometimes just completely ruin my day and not always, sometimes the people who leave bad comments, they're so like ignorant in the whole way that they word things and their understanding that it doesn't bother me at all. I'm just like, wow, what an idiot. But occasionally somebody will come in with like either a, what feels like a purposely bad faith take, or they're just out here trying to be insulting and ugly to get a rise out of me. And I hate that it can work. But I really, really want to like go over to her and be like, see how many people are like happy for you. And, you know, like later on in the episode, we see another couple of more negative comments. And I wasn't totally sure if it was supposed to be like the more pe the more she leaves this photo up the more negative it begins to get like the first people to see it are friends and they're more supportive. But then as time goes on, it becomes more of a problem. Um, the comments she gets later are a lot of things like you're too pretty to be a lesbian or what a waste. You guys, I have to confess that I have said what a waste when finding out that hot men are gay before. And at the time, I genuinely thought it was a compliment. I really did. I was like, what? It's just because he's so incredibly hot. Not understanding like that is so dehumanizing. Oh my God. Like acting like this entire person is 
a waste because I can't fuck them? Ew. Oh my God. Like, what the fuck? But I said that shit with my entire chest and thought I was funny. I mean, you know, it's 2023, folks. Let's get it the fuck together. We don't say this shit anymore. Um, so at this point, we have a little conversation between these three where they're zeroing in on the fact that she is texting Tao again. And Darcy clocks the fact that L is into him. And she admits, I think I have a crush on Tao. And she says, it's not like I can say anything to him. It's, he's my best friend and definitely doesn't like me back. And I am like, oh my God, I cannot believe how wrong you are. Like, I just don't believe it. I don't believe it. I think Tao does like her back. I just do. Now, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I am not wrong. So anyway, it killed me how fucking certain she is. She like, she just says, oh, yeah, no, it's absolutely never going to happen. I'm like, wow, girl, you are not great at reading this at all, in my opinion. Like, ah. Uh. So if they say, you don't know that. I definitely do. You don't even want to try telling him, no, can we talk about something else? At which point, I think Darcy says, ugh, boring. And I was like, Darcy is all of us. We just want to talk about this L. I apologize that you don't, but I'm afraid it's too late. The subject has started and we are on it. But indeed, for the moment, they try and move on. This does not last. We will talk about it later. So then we have another instance of Harry goading Tao. Harry comes up behind him and he just sort of like pushes past him in a way that's like you could try and, and write it off as, oh, oh, you like it was just an accident. But he says to him, watch out, dick nozzle. And Tao says, if you want my attention that badly, why don't you throw something at me again? Like your last remaining brain cell. Again, Harry's friends laugh at him. And as he begins to back away and Tao is like continuing to walk, I'm like, this really was successful. Like that shut him down. And later on, Harry asks Tao, are you meeting your boyfriend for lunch again? And he says, no, actually, I'm meeting your mom. And I was just like, okay. Tao, one, is killing it, like, with the comebacks, like, just fucking excellent. But two, this has got to come to a real head. This is, like, Harry is coming out the loser too often. And when a person is a bully like this, they come out a loser enough and they lash out in a big way. So I am not looking forward to that. Oh, hello. I'm sorry, everybody. Sam has come to visit. Can you all see him? You can probably see his little tail. Sorry. He's uh, feeling a little bit restless today. But um, I, I yeah, the, the fact that Tao, I want, I want to just enjoy the fact that Tao keeps on getting the better of Harry and managing to shut him down. But I know from experience and from observation, this cannot continue this way. Harry, all of his like social capital depends on being able to push other people around. And if he keeps getting setbacks like this, he is going to find a major way. And I feel like it's going to have to be really physical because he is a physical person. He doesn't have the capacity to have like a spirited debate. That's simply not who he is. He is a, th I throw things at you and body check you kind of dude. So I am really worried that he's actually going to try and like hurt Tao somehow. And I just don't want to see it, man. I, I'm like hoping that there's something that he tries to do that maybe Nick intervenes. You know, I don't know what that would even look like, but 
I, I just I just want to put it out there how nervous I am because I like I said wanted to just sit back and be like ah got him but I couldn't enjoy it there was just this niggling feeling in the back of my head like yeah this is about to get bad though so we then have Tara in the music room and she's looking at all those like other negative comments and uh Darcy sort of sneaks up on you, come, sneaks up on her, comes in and uh, it turns out that this room like locks from the inside. I have a lot of questions about why a room filled with like valuable instruments would lock from the inside. That's super weird, guys. Am I wrong about that? I don't get that at all. That feels like one, counterproductive and two, dangerous, like in a liability sort of sense. So, oh, Cindy says the door is broken. Okay. I did not catch them saying that. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so this turns out to be the spot where the two of them had their first kiss. And I love the fact that they're like cuddled up in the corner and this teacher comes in and is like, I know it's nice to sit and gossip with your friends, rehearsal is starting and they're like oh my god literally the only woman who does not know or only person on campus who doesn't know that we are a couple and there's a girl in their class i don't know like what her deal is at all but she says i never would have guessed that you were gay but it's so cool and brave of you and i really like this was a moment where i started to understand a little bit better what Tara is feeling here because you know the feeling of okay we've got a lot of positive comments but there are a few negatives and those seem to outweigh the positives that's something online that's something that feels a little bit distant and I want her to get over but it's also like understandable this moment is pure support. Somebody being like trying to show that they accept and I don't know if I want to say care about her, but at least support her. And yet it doesn't hit right. And I was sort of sitting back and thinking about it because Tara looks unhappy. And I was like, Okay, so I think there's two things happening. One, she starts off with, I would never have guessed that you were gay. Which, if we all just take a look at that, is a weird thing to say. Like, again, I thought on sight, I would know what a lesbian looks like. And look, that is not to say that there isn't like a queer aesthetic that is very real that I think a lot of us recognize at this point. It, there is 100%. But also there are a lot of queer people who do not subscribe to that aesthetic in any way. And oftentimes the people who do are doing so because they're like in a way also signaling to other people. I'm part of this community and you know, I would like to talk to you or you are safe with me or this, you know, like it's, it's part of a message about who you are as is any way of presenting yourself. So starting it off with just, I, I, I would never have been able to tell is just not awesome. And then being like, it's so cool and brave of you. And the cool part, like, it's not cool that you're gay. You just are, you know, it's like being like, oh, it's so cool that you're left handed. Like, I guess lots of people are left handed. It's not anything that you have like control over. Cool is something that you like embody from an attitude, but your orientation is just like what you are. So there's that as well. And then there's also the brave, 
which is a real double-edged sword. And this is something that actually can come up for me as well because I'm fat. When people say, oh my God, you're so brave. A lot of the time it's like really patronizing and it's meant to be like, I can't believe you're taking this risk because what you are doing is actually low key shameful. And I would definitely be ashamed were I you. So good for you for not having the shame that I think you probably should have. And I don't think that's what this girl means at all. But there is just sort of a sense to using the word brave. It's true, in my opinion. She is being brave. But I can understand how overnight everybody is looking at Tara and she has become the school lesbian. And it is a totally different deal when your identity becomes something when you just wanted it to be like, I have a girlfriend and I want people to know. And now it's like, you're a fucking mascot. She didn't ask for that. And so the look that she gets here, I started to be like, okay, yeah, everywhere she goes, this is the fucking like topic of discussion. This must be a lot. Um, so anyway, I felt so bad for her because this is clearly like wearing on her. And a little bit later, when everybody gets together for milkshakes, she says something about how things change when you come out and not always in a good way. And you see Darcy kind of give her a look like, are you ashamed or not ashamed? Are you regretting that you came out? And I don't think she regrets it, but it is just like, you know, all anybody is discussing. And after this rehearsal, there's a couple girls who were just like, oh my God, it's the lesbian. Lesbians are so disgusting. She's so gross. And uh, I just honestly wish somebody would slap these bitches. Like, just, I don't want a conversation. I don't want reasoned debate, rational discussion. I just really want violence inflicted on these bitches. That's what I want. So I don't know, get somebody over here. I just need some slapping. Um, and oh my God, I forgot that Darcy says, you want me to throw some cheese at them? Cause she just carries cheese. <laughs> so we can go to a really cute scene with, uh, with, Nick, it starts out as a cute scene. It becomes difficult with Nick and Charlie. They're like in a park, I think, and they're laying on the ground. It might be in, in Nick's yard. I don't know, but they're laying on a blanket on the ground and they're talking about when Charlie knew. And he's just like, I just always kind of knew I was like aware of it from a really young age. And Nick is like, yeah, I just didn't have a sense of it. And later on, when he talks to Tara, he's like, I feel like I did actually like you. I think that maybe I can be into girls. I love Tara saying kissing you was the thing that cemented for me that I didn't like boys. And he just says, well, happy to help. <laughs> oh, God. But yeah, there's a moment here where Charlie says, you want to kiss? And... Nick says yes, and they are about to when a couple walks by. It's just fucking like anybody. They're not important. But Nick freezes up and gets really, you know, tense, apologizes to Charlie. And you could see him look at Charlie and again, just so much like shame, but also gratitude because he could see that Charlie really like is trying to be patient. Um, so eventually we go to the like day long rehearsal. They get like a whole day off in the music room to rehearse for a concert that's coming up, which is wild. My school would never. Um, and this is when he has the convo with Tara and he tells her that he is with Charlie he says, because she, she gives him a, a very knowing look, 
that I think prompts him. And he says, actually, well, uh, we're sort of going out. And she's like, oh, my God. And I was so thrilled, you guys. It never even occurred to me that he would tell her. I didn't think he would be telling anybody. And uh, I wasn't really sure how this was going to go. But like by the end of the episode, everybody knows except Tao. Like Isaac isn't with them. But it's accepted that he knows, like Charlie says, I'm pretty sure he's been aware of what's going on between the two of us since fucking day one, which I appreciate his faith because, yes, I am also certain of this. Um, but this conversation where, you know, he's asking Tara, like, how are you guys out to everybody? She says, yeah, I posted it on Insta. Some people were surprised. A couple of people already knew. And you can see that she was like about to say some people are being kind of shitty about it. But Darcy sneaks up on her with her trumpet because she's apparently just been trying to like scare Tara and interrupts. So she doesn't get a chance to really say anything until later on when they're having milkshakes. Um, But they have a lunch together and propose going on a double date. And Eventually, there is a plan that is formulated to invite Tao and L and try and create a couple out of the two of them. Weirdly phrased by me, but I stand by it. Um, so we have a short scene with Charlie and his sister. Uh, who we, I don't think we saw at all last episode. He says, you can't come in here. Nick's coming around. And she says, oh, I didn't realize you were in a committed relationship. And he says, what? We're not. He's not. Shut up. And she says, oh, so no, uh, no wedding bells ringing out, basically. And he says, even if we were together, and then there's a knock on the door and he just like flies past her and she gives him a knowing look before she takes a sip of her water, I guess. I, don't, I would not be surprised if that was vodka because she just gives off a drunk vibe, even though she isn't, I don't think. She just seems drunk. Um, so then we have, you know, the two of them trying to study, but getting distracted by one another. It's all very adorable. And... Nick tells Charlie, I was talking to Tara today. I told her that we were together. And oh my God, Charlie is so thrilled. Like this is one step closer to actually being publicly out. And it's, it's a huge, huge deal. And rightfully, he's just like, you are amazing. Are you sure you wanted to and aren't like trying to push yourself before you're ready for my sake, which is very sweet. I appreciate that he even considers that possibility because that's a real possibility, you know? Um, and they make out a little bit on the floor. Just the cutest, honestly. He proposes the uh, milkshake double date, which of course Charlie agrees to. And it's just... You know, it's everything. I love it. So, like I said, we set up the double date because they have like a four-way chat. Are talking about how L is into Tao and apparently Charlie did not know. Which, uh, the fact that they're telling Charlie and Nick, I was really, like, frustrated by this because I totally get that they mean well. I really, really do. But God, you guys, this was so poorly done. So here's the thing. I, I feel like people don't appreciate the difference in how to handle folks with crushes who have different personalities. And 
what they're doing here with trying to sort of force things between Tao and L. L is so clearly a reserved and private person. I'm not trying to say that she's like cold or anything, but she plays things close to the chest and is somewhat guarded. And she has said as much to Tao that she like finally realized that she needed to take a risk and open herself up to people or else she was not going to be making any friends. So the fact that they push this as hard as they do, it felt like so obviously the wrong approach to me. This is the sort of thing that might work if there were a real sign that the other person was also interested that they could point to. We know, I'm pretty certain that Tao is interested because we have been watching Tao as an audience and his interactions with Elle from his side of things and see the way that he reacts to her. So I feel pretty confident in saying that he's interested. But Tara and Darcy really, they don't have any such information to go off that I've seen. And even if they had, this is like something that they sort of had to pull out of Elle at lunch. She didn't even want to tell them. So them going and blabbing it to Charlie, who is like part of her inner friend circle, but didn't know. If he didn't know, it's because she didn't want him to know. It's a very specific situation. And the way that they attempt to handle this is just incredibly disrespectful. And I was glad that she wound up really standing up for herself because Darcy, again, I think she really means well. I do. But there's a, a, a there's almost a sense for me of like focus on yourself girl you know she's she's so she's pushing it so hard and you've got to let people like slowly unfold at their own pace sometimes you can't just like tear them open and i i i just it was it was hard to watch because again I am pretty convinced that Tao is interested in her as well, but because I think Tao actually has the same viewpoint as L, I think he is completely certain that L is not into him and never will be. When Darcy makes some comment like, uh, what a cute couple you two are or something like that. What a cute pair. Tao like gets really weird and awkward and changes the subject in such a way that I see L misreading that and thinking he's changing the subject because he isn't interested and doesn't want to give the impression he is. Whereas what I think is really happening is he is interested and knows in quotes, knows L isn't. And so wants to move things on before she has to suffer much awkwardness. And it's just, it was just hard to watch because it felt like so obviously not the way to handle things with L or with Tao. Like Tao is really resistant to change. I don't see him as somebody who enjoys risk. This is just not going to be how this would go. If he winds up telling L how he feels about her, it's going to be an extremely private moment. Um, so anyway, that was just, uh, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but I, I also want to say, you guys, can we just like take a second to talk about this fucking milkshake truck? What in the hell kind of fairy tale milkshake truck? This thing, it's like this, this adorable mint green vintage ice cream truck with a tent next to it. That's got all of this kitschy decorating and a bunch of brightly colored painted, uh, what do you call them? Um, picnic tables underneath. And they're making these milkshakes that are like 
The, you know what this reminds me of is the food from Hook that the Lost Boys eat that like turns all of these bright colors and it all looks pretty much like whipped cream. That's what these milkshakes looked like to me. They look like whipped cream, which they probably were something like that because, you know, you can't have ice cream on screen. It's very impractical. So usually what they do is they'll use like mashed potatoes or something. Um, but I couldn't get over the utter perfection of this aesthetic. It was absolute like murder to my soul. I want this place to be real so bad. And I am so angry that it's not. There's a moment where the camera pulls back and they're sprinkling rainbow sprinkles on the top of this milkshake. And there's like the person doing it is wearing this deep teal apron and they're holding a yellow spoon and an orange cup and the sprinkles are, you know, rainbow raining down on this bright blue, yellow and red milkshake. And then there's like an orange polka dot cup of straws that are striped in all these different colors in the foreground. And it was just like a series of Instagram moments, but a real place and like real in quotes, obviously it's not a real place. But it could be, it could be a real place. And like these milkshake glasses, they remind me of, uh, for those of us who have Friendly's restaurants, they are the kind of Sunday glasses that like Friendly's uses. And it's all the most gorgeous, like picture. It's so, it's so perfect. I'm, you guys, it hurts me. I love when people get the aesthetic right, when they do something very, very specific and they fucking nail it. And this is like the kind of, of like little ice cream parlor milkshake shop that I would build an animal crossing. For example, it's just, I love it so much anyway. Um, so they're all making small talk in the tent and we have the moment that I've already talked about. I am going to breeze on past that now that we've already talked about it. Um, and Nick and uh, Charlie go up and get refills on their milkshakes. I love that Nick gets a, what was it? Oh, right. Bubble gum. He gets a bubble gum milkshake. You guys, I judged him. I judged him a lot for this one. And then he asks if he can try Charlie's and he takes a sip and he just backs off and goes, wow. And Charlie says, see, I make good choices. Oh, we should swap. No, you made your choice. I have this all the time because I am like good with food. I'm a good cook and I know what flavors go well together. Almost every time Owen and I go out to eat, either my entree is way better than his or my drink off enough. I'll get a cocktail winds up being way better than his. And so many times he has been like, why don't I ever just like order what you're ordering? I always like what you get better. Uh, but yeah, you can't have any, babe. I'm sorry. You're going to have to live with your choice. Maybe we come back next time and you get the correct thing this time. Um, so anyway, the, the two of them are like in the midst of talking and they're being cute. But Tao is, he like walks up and he says something like, I hope I'm not interrupting, but it's clear. Like he doesn't get that they're on a triple date. He, so for him, he's not really seeing the, the significance of everything. And when he walks up, it's clear, like I did interrupt something and didn't intend to. And they try and break the awkwardness up a little bit by, oh, well, I'll stay here and I'll get the last one. You guys go on ahead. But it still feels really weird. And this is when they wind up in the tent with just Darcy, Tara, and Elle. And it's broken to Elle that this is a triple date. And Elle is realizing, oh my God, oh my God. And she's so excited and happy for Charlie. This is what Charlie wanted. And it seemed fucking impossible. Like the straight rugby star, there was no chance. And now look at us, you know, but 
I the the fact that they're all finding this out and Tao sees them like from the milkshake truck he's looking over and and cuz L like makes an exclamation when she finds out I was worried that he would come back and kind of try and ask like well what's been going on since I had since I've been gone and he doesn't he just lets it go and I'm wondering what he thinks they're talking about when he glances over because there's a sense of him seeming like he feels like he's missing something I don't know the whole thing was I couldn't really read what was going on with him um so I I was really happy though to find out that like they're going to also tell Tara or not Tara L uh it is really it's just really nice. Um, I love her saying to him, you didn't have to witness the months of intense pining. And I don't know, is there a sense of almost maybe Tao knows what's being said and like is afraid? Like, I, I don't know. He glances over and then away so quickly that part of me thought he did get it. You know, I don't know. But anyway, what he does is come back and tell everybody that the concert is starting in 15 minutes, which prompts them all to begin drinking their milkshakes really fast. But part of me was sort of like, did he want to rush things so that they all left this spot because he didn't like the way Nick was getting to be part of the gang? You know, I don't know. Um, it's just, it felt like he was sort of pushing, pushing things along because he sensed them becoming closer and he was just left out. And, you know, Tao, I get that you're being a friend and I believe, like, I believe you that you are trying to be a good friend, but if you weren't so anti Nick, he might feel a little bit cooler about telling you things. That's all. Um, there's a really cute moment where Elle puts her arm around Tao and says, I really love you. And he says, I love you too, and puts his arm around her. And it was the first time that I started to kind of doubt whether he was interested or not. Because if he had a crush on her, I feel like he would have had more of a reaction than he does. But it could just be that he is so taking it for granted that this is just friend talk that he's not allowing any other interpretation into his head, you know? So anyway, we go to everybody setting up for the big concert that's coming a little bit later, practicing on the drums, yada, yada. Eventually, Tara, who has been getting more message, like more, not messages necessarily, but like comments, she wants to get the hell out of there. She's kind of freaking out. And she goes to the music room. Darcy follows her in, but she lets the door lock behind her which results in them missing the opening of the concert and everybody has to go looking for them a little bit later in a big like kind of over the top moment of searching and it turns out that Darcy's been out for a while and uh, so it made me sort of surprised that like if Darcy's been out so long and Tara has been like right by her side all the time. I was kind of surprised that there hadn't already been any rumors, but apparently there weren't. So Tara's just having a hard time with like how much dramatically everything has changed. And she asks, do you regret it? And she says, no, but I just wasn't really prepared for how big a change this was going to be. Everyone's acting like I am a completely different person you came out years ago. Everybody has gotten used to this, but I'm not loud and confident about this. I could barely even say the word lesbian. And now people are just like blurting it out in my face all the time and passing by me in the hall and kind of giving me looks. I just don't even know what to do. I feel like I'm under a spotlight and I just want to live my life. Uh, you're so confident about your sexuality and I still feel like I know nothing. And I just want to be like, Oh babe, I, you like just talked to Nick and 
you were kind of a model for him and an inspiration for him. Like we all are just making it up as we go along. You know, we all are. We're just doing our fucking best. <laughs> oh my God. I saw a meme yesterday and it was like, you know, on like the background of a sunrise to look like it was going to be really inspirational. And it said, every day you are trying your best. And then under that, which is really kind of embarrassing. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> um, so they huddle up for a little while, but like I said, they eventually are found. It's a cute moment though of support. I liked it. I was glad that she had a chance to like talk this over with Darcy and be honest with her. Um, Nick has to bring her her instrument and is like, are you all right? And it feels like he's asking her about more than just the concert. And we see the family sitting out there. It's funny because like my school had a dedicated auditorium. This looks like it's just the uh, gymnasium. And it's a pretty like small audience considering how fucking huge their schools are. But, uh, L turns and looks at Tao and gets another little heart floating above her head. Tao has come to the concert, but freely admits to Charlie that they're super boring and he's just here because he's a supportive friend, um, which I respect, honestly. And the way that this is staged, I just wanted to mention that Charlie is sitting like in the back because he's on the drums, but there's like a single beam of sunlight coming in through like a I don't know if it's a skylight or just a window, but it's like per just exactly on him. And I have mentioned the fact that Charlie has a very elfin look. And I was like trying to place it, what it is that he was reminding me of here. And I suddenly recalled, he looks like the kid from Love Actually who plays the drums. That kid had similar like giant eyes and a very pointed sharp featured face he's the one who plays jojen reed in song of ice and fire as well and uh the look that kid has on his face and his eyes and everything were so similar and i was just like oh god he looks just like him for a second even though that kid was meant to be a lot younger than charlie is um but anyway oh i'm so sorry cindy says i snorted but i i was on a different tab. So I don't know what I said or whether it was like snorted at something from the dialogue. Um, Cindy says they could totally play brothers at some point. Oh, they definitely could. Huh? Cause yeah, Jojen Reed's British also. Um, mm, that would be interesting. I wonder how old Jojen is at this point. I, uh, <laughs> it's such a shame cause I really enjoy that little actor, but Jojen is such a boring character. Um, all right, guys, I've got to wrap up. Thank you all again for hanging out with me. And once again, went long, but you know, it's fine. Hope y'all are enjoying the coverage. It's going to be a little while before I see you again. But until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.